What's up guys, Chris Schwartz Edmondson here from Schwartz Edmondson Web Design. Welcome to episode two of how do I make that in Squarespace. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at how to create this cool parallax hero section in Squarespace 7.1. Last week, I got an email from someone who sent me this tutorial of this parallax scrolling effect created from HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and they were wondering if it was possible to do in Squarespace. So original credit goes to this channel. I'm simply adapting and updating their code so that we can do this effect in Squarespace. The principle behind this effect is simple. Take an image, split it up into multiple layers, and then save out each layer as their own PNG image. As long as each layer's image has the same dimensions, when you stack them back on top of each other, they will appear as though the original image has been reconstructed. Except now we can control the movement of each layer independently. So the first thing I did was open the vector image in Illustrator, organize the different parts of the image into layers, and export each layer as a PNG. To make sure each layer has the same dimensions as your artboard, when exporting your layers, make sure to check Use Artboards. This is really important as it will clip any portions of layers that are outside the artboard and will also save layers that are smaller than the artboard, such as the moon here, at the same dimension as the artboard. If we did not click that setting, the moon would be saved at the dimension of the layer, which we don't want. Let's jump into Squarespace and add a section to the top of the page. Next, we will add all of the image layers to image blocks in the section. The order that you upload them in matters, so start by uploading the backmost layer and work your way forward. That goes for our text and button block we are adding as well. Because we want them to be behind our front mountain, I will add those blocks before the front mountain image. Now that we have all of the blocks added to the section, we can start writing our CSS to position the image blocks absolutely relative to the section. So now let's go ahead and target this section. I'm using the Chrome extension, the Squarespace block identifier extension. So now I click on the section ID and it grabs it. And now I can open up some curly brackets and any CSS I write here is going to be limited to this one section. So the next thing I want to do is I want to set all of these image blocks. Basically, I want to turn them into like background images for this section. So we're going to position them absolutely relative to the section that they're in. So uh, in order to do that, we need to target all of the image blocks in the section. So I'm going to target each image block using their class of image block. And you can see each image block in the section gets that same class of image dash block. So the way you target classes in CSS is with a period. So I'll do dot image dash block and open up some curly brackets. And now we're targeting all image blocks. But one thing to note about image blocks is um, they have their own elements. Uh, th there's multiple layers and levels that make up the image block. So the image block has other divs in it, and they have properties that, that give the image its width and its height. So like, for example, inside of this image block, if we look at this uh, element here, it has a maximum width of 2500. So this this element can't get any bigger than that. Uh, and if we go in further and toggle this open, um, this gives it its aspect ratio. So it's getting a pad padding bottom of 45%. And then if we go to the image itself, it's getting a left, a top, a width, a height, um, all these different properties are being set on the image itself but we don't want the image blocks to be determining the width and the height of the image. We want the image block to get the width and the height of the section as a whole. We want it to fill up the full width and full height. So what we need to do is we need to target not just the image block itself, but all of these different elements uh, within the image block. And we need to reset all these properties so that uh, the image block is not determining any of those properties. So the way that we can do that um, is we can target the image block and we can also target all elements inside the image block by targeting the image block class and then following it by a space and an asterisk. So this is targeting all elements inside of the image block. And now we can start resetting all of those properties. So the first thing I wanna do is give them a uh, position of absolute. And I'm going to be using important tags on most of these properties just to make sure that we are overriding all of Squarespace's inline styles. So I'm going to give it a width of 100%, a height of 
a max width of 100%, a left of 0, a top of 0, a padding of 0, a margin of 0, and now we can see that we've kind of reset all of our image blocks here, and they're not the full height of the section though. So we can see that they are positioned absolute, but absolutely positioned elements, they get positioned absolute relative to their nearest parent that also has a position defined. So what that means is we can go to our image block uh, in the section. So here's all of our different image blocks, and they are all in, let me just go ahead and close that image block there. So all of these blocks are in a column here. Um, and so the nearest parent that has a position defined for these elements, let's just go search through the parents. So a parent is, um, all these blocks are inside of other elements. So the elements that they're inside are considered their parents. So let's go up to the nearest parent. There's no position defined. We can go up to SQS row and we can see that, oh, this does have a position defined. So right now, if we ho hover over this element, we can see that these blocks are being positioned relative to this nearest parent. So what we need to do is we need to target that SQS row class and we'll set its position to un uh, unset. And so now you can see, cool, so it's no longer being positioned relative to this element. The image has jumped much bigger than that, but now they're being positioned relative to some other parent. So if we go up through the parent elements and we can see if they have a position defined, and none of these do, but if we go up to the content wrapper class, we can see that the content wrapper class does have a position of relative. And that's the last uh, parent before the section that has a position defined. So we also need to set this uh, this element's position to unset. So let's go ahead and add a comma, and then we'll target the content wrapper. And now we've also set that element's position to unset as well. So now the nearest parent with a position defined is the parent container. This is the section that all those image blocks are in. And we can see that this one does have a position of relative. Here we go, position relative. Okay, perfect. So now whatever height and width the section is, the images are gonna be 100% width and 100% height as well. Um, and here I do have some <laughs> misspellings it looks like. Important, just wanna make sure that all those are spelled correctly. There we go. Okay, so now um, the images are warping. They're 100% width and height of the section. Um, no matter what the dimensions of the section are, they're gonna squeeze and squish and warp um, to make sure that that is true. And so that's not what we want. We want them to keep their aspect ratios, but we just wanna make sure that they fill the section. And the way that we can do that is we can give them an object fit of cover. And what that does is it just says, make sure that the image is at least 100% width and 100% height. It can be more than that, it just can't be less than that. And that way all the images keep their aspect ratios, um, which looks much better. Uh, so that's awesome. Um, and this element, it only ap applies to image elements. Um, and so it's actually, it's being added to every single element inside the image block. But since it only applies to image elements, uh, it you know, it doesn't really matter that we're applying it to every element. So it perfectly solves our problem. The next thing you might notice is that the button is not clickable, and that's because our front mountain layer is covering it up. So what we can do is we can make the image blocks invisible to the pointer by setting a pointer events of none. Uh, and so now the images are invisible, so it doesn't matter that they're stock stacking on top of the button and text, we now can interact with those elements. Okay, so I want my first section to be full height. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna edit that section and then I'm going to set the section height to large and I'll hit save. 
Now, one thing that I wanna address right now is um, you might have noticed things get a little bit wonky when you go into edit mode. Um, it, like it's, it's just kind of looks a little bit strange. So we don't necessarily want this CSS to apply when we're edit, in edit mode because it makes it much harder to edit the section. So what we can do is we can make sure that the CSS only applies when the site is not being actively edited. Uh, and the nice thing is we can do that with CSS because Squarespace adds classes to the body depending on the state that the editor is in. So right now, because we're in like the back end of Squarespace, we're not viewing the live site, the body gets a class of SQS edit mode. But if we actively edit the page, then a class of SQS edit mode active gets added to the body. So what we can do is we can target our section within the body. So I'll add body, uh, but not when the body has a class of dot sqs edit mode active and so now when we go to edit our section everything jumps back to normal these are just normal blocks in the section but as soon as we save we now get our our positioned absolute images um, looking as we want them to so we're done with the css for now so Let's go ahead and go to our code injection window by going to settings, advanced code injection, and we're gonna write all of our JavaScript in the footer code injection. We will open up some script tags and then create a function called parallax anims. A function doesn't run on its own without being called though, so we will need to call the function down below. The game plan for our JavaScript is to capture the amount someone has scrolled down the page and use that amount to offset each image using transform translate. To capture the scroll amount, we can set up an event listener to listen for scroll events and store that number in a variable called value. Window.scrollY gets the pixel offset from the top of the window. We can actually see this number by writing console.log value and going to the console in our inspect tools. Every time we scroll, the variable gets updated with the pixel offset. Let's delete the console.log and store our block IDs as variables so it is easier to transform them. We're going to use const variables since the block IDs will not be changing. Give each a name, and since we're using block IDs to target the elements, we will write document.getElement by ID and then paste in the block ID. Do this for each element, setting up the variable name and targeting the block by its ID. Once we have stored all of the blocks in variables, we can now start transforming them. We can write CSS in JavaScript by targeting the element .style.css property, in this case, transform. We will set it equal to translate y since we want to move it up and down and multiply our value variable by 0.3 and add pixels to it. If we want an object to move slower than the scroll speed, we will multiply our scroll amount by something less than 1. If you want it to move faster, multiply it by more than 1. Since I want the moon to scroll down faster, I will multiply it by 1.05. Go through each of the elements and set up their transforms. The text I want moving from side to side, so I'm going to use a translate x to restrict its movement to the x axis. Once you're done with all of the elements, you can then save and preview the effect. Now there's a couple of things that I wanna clean up here. Um, so I'm going to go back to the custom CSS window, and one thing that I want to do um, for sure is because we're animating the text off the screen, we get this big horizontal scroll bar here. So I would just want to add an overflow of hidden to the section. So I'm going to come up right below the section opening curly brackets, and I'm going to set the overflow to hidden. And now when we scroll down the page, we no longer get that uh, overflow. Now, one thing I want to address is I don't like that my text is being covered up by the mountain here, and I want to move my text and my button up. So I want to target an element that contains both the text and the button, and if we move that element up, then our text and button, of course, will move up as well. Since all of our blocks are within this SQS column 12 element here, if I just add some potting, padding bottom to that element, it's going to move that element up, and then my text and my button will be moved up as well. So I'm gonna target this class here, I'm gonna copy it, and I'll drop down below my image block targeting, and we'll target that SQS column 12 class, and we'll add padding bottom to it, and let's do like 200 pixels. Now it looks good on desktop, 
But one of the problems with using a fixed pixel value like this is that when we go down to mobile, 200 pixels on a smaller screen is a much larger fraction of the height of the screen than on desktop. So on desktop, this is a subtle change. On mobile, it's much too big of a change. So instead of using a fixed pixel value like this, it would be much better to use a responsive value like viewport width units. So let's say I wanna do 13 viewport width units. It's now going to be adding a padding bottom equal to 13% of whatever the width of the viewport is. So on mobile, that's gonna be a much smaller change. And on desktop, um, it's gonna be a little bit larger of a change. But again, it's dependent on the width of the viewport, so it's responsive that way. But one thing about using viewport width units is there's no like upper or lower limits on that. So as the screen gets wider and wider and wider, it's gonna keep going up and up and up and up. So one way we can limit how far it goes up the screen is by using the clamp property. So the cramp, clamp property takes three inputs. It takes a lower input. So let's say we never want uh, the padding bottom to get lower than 30 pixels. Then it's gonna take the ideal value. So again, we ideally we want it to be 13% of the viewport width, but we never want it to be more than like 240 pixels, for example. So this is the way that we can set an upper and lower limit on uh, our ideal value here of 13 viewport width units. So again, it'll never the padding will never get greater than this pixel value or lower than this pixel value, but we want it to be this value here. So now as we get on to mobile, awesome, it's not crowding the moon anymore. And as we get up to larger screen sizes, it's still uh, also not going up too much. So now we have a really awesome responsive parallax effect. Um, it actually doesn't take that much CSS. Uh, and it doesn't take that much code either, which is great. One final thing uh, that you could do is you could move this function to the page header code injection of the page that the parallax is on. Um, and that would just cut down on your footer code injection clutter. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy this function here. We need to leave the call to the function in the footer though, because we want the function to run after all the content has loaded on the page. And uh, putting it in the footer code injection puts it at the end of the body element. So all the, the content of the page will load and then our function will run. But we'll save that and we'll go to the page header code injection and we can keep the function there. And again, just cuts down on the clutter uh, that can build up in the footer code injection. Um, so one thing you have to remember is to also include script tags in the header though paste that in there and click save. And now it'll run just the same, but we're again, cutting down on the clutter and staying a little bit more organized. All right, I hope you found this tutorial helpful. Let me know in the comments below if you feel comfortable enough or confident enough to try and tackle this on your own.